Welcome everyone to the 2017 conference. I have the honor of introducing to you Evelyn Gonzalez. My name is Raz Adekunle. Evelyn, her husband, and four ch college age children live in San Leandro, California. Her oldest and youngest son both have INS. Evelyn holds a degree in biology from the University of Maine and worked in the field of cystogenetics for nearly a decade. She returned to graduate school and received a master's in divinity degree from the Dominican School of Philosophy and Theology at the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, California. She served for eight years as the director of youth and young adult ministry for the Diocese of Oakland. One of her responsibilities was to write curriculum. As a parent of two children with nystagmus, she became, a ver became very aware of how accommodations for various student needs could enhance the curriculum for these students. Currently, she serves as a school board trustee for the San Leandro Unified School District in California. She also serves on the board of the Mid-Alameda County Special Education Local Plan Area. I present to you Evelyn Gonzalez. So prior to me um, getting involved in the school board, I was a parent like you. I had kids that I was struggling to try to figure out how to navigate the education system, and I became a, an advocate. So I started getting parents together, students that had special needs, and, and finding out and helping them navigate the system uh, with younger kids. And then eventually I, I um, ran for election for school board, and, and now I represent, so I'm one of each school district in our area has one representative that oversees special education in multi-districts. And so I oversee four different districts and their special education programs. Funding, making sure we're follow, following policy and procedures. And so that's where my different hats, parent hat, as well as now I do the administrator hat that I wear for school board. So I have a lot of handouts because I think that's mostly why you're here, is to get some things that you can take back with you. Um, so we're going to run through the presentation. The first part is, is pretty, much the, um, um, pretty much laws we're going to talk about, and then we'll get to the fun stuff. So we'll do this. I wanted to start this with two stories. So these are my two children that have nystagmus. Um, so Juan, and Juan's actually here today. So my oldest one is 22. My youngest one is 18. So ne Juan and Nico. So, I don't know, one of the parents that I was working with asked the question, um, so how did your kids navigate the lockers in sixth grade? You know, were they able to open the lockers? And I said, I don't know. So I went to both of them and asked, how did you deal with a thing like opening a locker in sixth grade? So Juan answers, oh, it was really tough. I could never figure it out. I went to the counselor and said, I can't use the locker. What do I do? And she said, just keep your books here in the counseling office. So I was like, OK. Then I asked Nico, what did you do? Nico goes, oh, yeah, a lock was really hard for me to do. I went to all my teachers and told them I have a vision impairment and that I needed a set of books to keep at home and a set of books to keep in the classroom. And mind you, this is the same school experience, same school. But they, and then I said, did the teachers do that? And he goes, oh, yeah, I told them if they didn't, you know, if it was a problem, I knew it would be hard, that I was happy to go to the principal and talk to him, <laughs> him for them. So, so again, the same, the same um, issue that they faced, but two different responses based on what worked for them. I'm happy to say what they both said was after a few months, when they stopped being so nervous about being at middle school, they were both able to figure out how to open the lockers. And they realized there were lots of other sixth graders that had no vision impairment that were struggling to open the lockers too. And so, but, but again, two different stories. And again, I think one of the benefits is, you know, genetically they have the same nystagmus, but they've had two totally different presentations and they have different 
504s because they needed different accommodations. So I also bring that in that not every case here is going to have the same thing that your child needs. Um, so here's the different things we'll cover. Um, so the difference between IEPs and 504s, um, accommodations and modifications are very different. Um, you'll learn how to prepare for a meeting, which I think is the big thing, is what do we do as parents, and then strategies for state and national testing. Okay, so 504s. Um, so there's a section of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 that created and extended civil rights to people with disabilities. So basically, this is the Civil Rights um, Act, that 504 is a section of it. And so we use the term 504s, but it is the Civil Rights Act that we're, we're referring to when we say 504s. And it provides children and adults with disabilities reasonable accommodation in education, employment, and other settings. Oh, sorry. So a plan is provided by a school to address the special needs of a student with a disability. And a nystagmus would, would involve addressing the vision impairment, the effects on the educational environment, and the student's learning. Now, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. So this is where IEPs come in. Um, so this is Education for All Handicapped Student, no, Handicapped Children's Act, and it was passed by Congress in um, 1975. And it was reauthorized in 1990, um, and then there's different parts of it. And so, and the reason I show you this, so you are aware of the different parts of it, is that if, how many of you have children under three? Okay, so as you can see, Part C is for children from birth to three years old, and this does affect school districts and the services they provide to children under three. And then it was, um, so some of the things, the individual education program, the IEP is covered under that, um, free and appropriate public education. So a school district does not need to pay for your child to go to a private education, um, if they can perform, if they can provide the environment that your child will excel in. And so, you have a question already? <laughs> well, okay, so she's asking if I can just share if they're in an independent school setting or if they're in a public school setting as I go along. And um, yes, I will, I will try to do this. So these are federal laws. And so basically all your, school to, your schools have to adhere to the 504 part of this. Now, this is public education focused. And so when you get to the IEP, the IEP part, they do not have to. And so, so that's a very good, clear distinction of this. Um, and then appropriate evaluation, meaning they have to have testing that really evaluates if the learning environment is appropriate for them. Um, and then your parents and your teachers participate equally in the conversations about whether the IEP are appropriate. And that's why we'll get to what you need to do as a parent in those settings. And then the um, law also ca calls for procedural safeguards in what they do. And then just for your information, it was reauthorized again in uh, 2004, and it was given the Improvement Act designation now. So. Again, you'll hear it referred to by your school districts in different ways. And then this is the crux. This is what I think most people are here for, trying to figure out. So is nystagmus covered under 504 or IEP? That's always a question on Facebook. Um, students with nystagmus don't automatically qualify for special education services. In order to be eligible for special education, you have to have a disability, which nystagmus is a disability, vision, disabilities are, are listed as one of the ways that you qualify for IEPs. So you have to have a disability, and as a result of that disability, you need special education in order to progress in school. Now, this varies from school district to school district of what does that mean, progress in school. Most will say if they're at grade level, they do not qualify for an IEP, if they're at grade level. They qualify for a 504 always, so the next thing. Students with nystagmus always qualify for a 504. 
but they only qualify for an IEP if they make, meet their district and their state guidelines of what they think. And some of that, most states um, do testing, and what they do is they do achievement testing to figure out where they are, where they are at grade level, or are they below grade level. And then they also do um, intelligent testing to see are they, where are they in the spectrum of IQs. And if they're at a higher than grade level IQ, you as a, as a school district only need to provide services to get them to average. So, so again, you can ask, what do you do in my school district to, um, to assess whether they qualify for an IEP? Every parent is, is allowed, or you have the right, to request an IEP meeting and an IEP evaluation. And so I do suggest that if you haven't done that, it's great because they do all kinds of testing that then can actually help with your 504 accommodations and what you asked for. So I do recommend that. But to be aware, just because they're visually impaired and it does spell it out in the law that they, they have a disability, they might not qualify in your school. So now we're gonna do modifications. Can you guys come? So these are some examples. It's, you're the next speaker, you can, <laughs> can you just pass those back? Um, so this is just a handout that taught, gives you some examples that you can look at for differences between modification and accommodation. Modification means that your student is not expected to learn what other students in the class learn. So for example, spelling test. So you have 10 words. So a, a first grader, or let's say second grader, comes home with 10 spelling words for the week. And they, if you modify it and say they can't learn 10 words, we're gonna give them five words. That's a modification. Accommodation means that they're expected to know what every other student does, but not, there's a buzzing. Is the buzzing from the equipment? Okay, keep going, okay. Um, so, so the accommodation means they're expected to know the same amount of material, so the 10 words, but maybe they, instead of having to write it down, they speak it. So that would be an accommodation versus a, a modification. And so I think for everyone, we want our children to learn as much as every other student. And we want to be able to figure out how they can successfully do that. And so that's where we're shooting for figuring out the accommodations. And sometimes teachers think it's easier to just go, oh, you know, it's easy to do, easier sometimes to do the modifications than to really work for the accommodations. Um, you know, eye fatigue is a big issue with kids with nystagmus. So we're always trying to figure out how do we prevent them from getting to the point where they, they're stressed and have a really hard time um, with their vision. And again, I think we oftentimes will move to the modification pretty quickly without thinking how they might be able to do it better with the accommodations. And, yes. <laughs> okay, so now preparing for an IEP 504 meeting. Um, you wanna, okay, so we're gonna hand out all three of these things. Uh, so I brought what I developed over time to bring to my meetings, and I always did a yearly gathering of all the teachers. And so they didn't, my kids had 504s, did not have IEPs, so it's a little less structured in how you meet. But I would ask for each of, you're gonna, I should preface, you're gonna be receiving a bunch of material, um, and so if you can just put it aside and not look at it, until I, I talk about each individual piece. But, um, so I would ask the teachers to meet for lunch. It's really hard to schedule all the teachers at one time. And so we would meet with the principal at lunch and I would bring lunch for the teachers. And it made them much more receptive to me coming in and taking up their lunch time. So bring lunch, have a gathering of them, and then I would try to go through, there's one of the sheets you're getting is a fact sheet and I gave them information on my child um, and nystagmus, because I would guarantee that none of my teachers had ever had a child with nystagmus and had no idea what that meant. And so I gave them a fact sheet on what it, um, on what it was. And so here's the fact sheet. 
And so I say, make, create this for your child. What is it that the teacher needs to know about them and their nystagmus? And make it as clear and as detailed as possible, but not overwhelming. And so, and again, you can use this. I'm gonna say thank you to my kids because they allowed me, you know, I had to get their permission because they're adults now to share with you the stuff. But I do think it's really helpful to see what someone else. Now, again, remember your child is different. So don't copy this, <laughs> make it, create it for yourself. Um, and then some of the pictures, how many of you have gotten a picture already? Oh, not yet? Okay. Do you want to pass that? Yep. No, so what you do is you bring the fact sheet, and, and usually what we do is we do, you do the 504 beforehand. So you've met with the counselor, you've met with the, the um, vision specialist of your school district, so you create the 504 plan separate from meeting with the teachers. So that's created um, behind the scenes. And then to activate it, so in the typical setting, what happens is the counselors meet with the teachers to make sure they understand what your child needs. But I, I have found it more helpful as a parent to actually meet with the teachers. And then to have the teachers meet together so that they can actually talk through, like, um, so one of the things is my kids needed extended time on testing. Well, if they have extended time in, in period one, that's gonna affect period two. And period three, you know, if they have extended time, that's gonna affect period four. So having the teachers meet together and come up with a plan of how they were gonna do that was easier. So that's why we did that. Okay, do you have pictures? Okay, so I tried for years to figure out how do I talk about what my kids see because it's not that they're blind, you know, and that's what people jump to when they talk visual acuity. Um, can I borrow this picture? So the top one is my son's ultimate Frisbee team. And what I do is I decrease the resolution of, whoops, I decrease the resolution on it and copy it. And so you get a picture that has less detail. So, and then I would ask him, is this what you see? Is this not? Know that you keep, he still gets the vivid colors. And so the colors, while they're muted on the resolution one, in real life, they aren't muted. It's the details that are muted. Um, so work with your kids to create a picture of like, you know, this worked because it was like, um, can you see the shirts? Uh, can you see the writing on the shirts? And we took it down to where you couldn't at that distance. And so take a common picture that you have. We used to use a cross country picture where there were houses on the hillside that a, a normal sighted person could see very clearly, but he could not see the houses, but he could see the hillside if that makes sense. You know, so do something like that. Keep, keep decreasing the resolution until your child says, yeah, you know, and they won't, they don't know what's normal. So when they look at a picture, they think, oh yeah, that's what I see. But then keep asking questions like, do you see the houses usually? And if you can stand where you're taking the picture, it's a lot easier too, because then they can say, oh no, I don't see that hillside. Or I can't read your shirt at that distance. Or I can't see your face expressions from that distance so those are the things we want to get across to the teachers that they're losing and then the other picture is the board so again trying to explain the board so you can see them writing and you can probably even make out what the numbers might be but if the teacher is saying it as they write and they're going two plus four then our kids fill it in because then they go, oh, that missing data, that's a two, that's a four. Um, so teachers that are verbal as they're writing on the board help our kids succeed. And so that's one of the keys too is, you know, they could fill this in wrong. You know, a six could very easily be an eight when they're copying it down. And so that's something that's very, very important to get across to them. Um, and so, uh, so again, create your own with your kids so that it's easy, you know, so they have buy-in and they accept it and it's part of them. But this is the best way, and again, it's not perfect. My kids tell me all the time, this is not a perfect way to describe it, but it helps, okay? So, and then 
Um, so some of the things that you can talk about that are kind of standard for the, the information sheet is the fluctuation in vision. That one day our kids can see the board better than the next day. And so that's also a thing to get across to teachers because when kids, mostly when kids have vision issues, it's standard from day to day. And it's standard under different like, it, under the same light conditions. But with nystagmus, it can vary and different light situations can also affect them. So, um, and then the null point, um, I think the presentation this morning talked about, they can have multiple null points for different distances. And so what we did was we would go into class and figure out where the best seat was for the null point for that distance. And so it, before the class started, the day before, we would go in and figure out what seat was best for the, him to sit in, and so. Yep, yeah, so actually, I think in the 504, may, I, we, every year we did it differently, but what we did was we actually wrote in the 504 that we got to visit the class the day before school started. So they could walk and see the boards, they could walk around the room, they could sit in the seats and figure out which seat was best, uh, because, I mean, it really helps if they've, you know, as the teacher's going, yes, over here is the homework chart. And your child's sitting there going, okay, that looks good. But if they've walked around the room and actually seen the homework chart beforehand, um, that's much easier for them to participate and understand. So, so I strongly encourage that accommodation that is written in all your 504s, is the day before being able to go into the classroom. You know, so, so again, I have four children, two that have normal sight. That's common with no, I know, I mean, all I children. But trying to figure it out. Like how to figure it out or what to tell the teachers or. So one of the things is for this age, um, you know, get the assessment through the school district early. So you're, you're allowed to get an assessment and they will be able to give you some feedback as to what the visual function, vi the functional vision is and then you can look at and sit with them on that report. And so even though they might not give you services, they'll give you the, um, the information to be able to communicate to their preschool teachers and okay. that. So yeah, the functional vision test uh, isn't always what they do from your pediatric ophthalmologist. And so that's a low vision specialist or it's a, a um, vision specialist through the uh, education system. Okay. And so you can ask your school and if, some schools, my school district does not do a vision function test, and so we had to go to a low vision specialist for that. And I didn't go until they were in middle school, and I, wait, you know, I didn't even know it existed. So visual, visual function test. Yep. Right. She knew where he should sit, on the right side, the left side, within four feet. So that was really important and that got incorporated into our IEP and report. Yeah, and that's, you know, at the younger age, you need to be an advocate for them. And then as they get older, they need to become more of an advocate for themselves. And it works out so much better when, when like Nico, telling the teachers, I need two books, you know. I'm like, if I had tried to tell the school district they should have the two books, I probably would have gotten maybe a no. But, you know, when a, when a child's asking for it, people are like, of course. What if, they, if he doesn't even think anything's wrong with him? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, so he doesn't wear glasses, so he yeah. doesn't, I don't know how that is. And then they, you write the beautiful accommodations, yeah, and they're like, I don't need that. So he's just in kindergarten first, and he's just in every place, and he just wants yeah. to accommodate. Yes. Um, how many of you have children that don't want to follow their accommodations? <laughs> and you work really hard on them. And so uh, I wish that I had the answer for that. I mean, 
I do. I don't have a very good answer. And I would say, again, my two children have very different ways of asking for, needing, and following their accommodations. And so it varies from child to child so much that I don't think there's one answer to that. And, you know, I would say the main thing is to let them take as much ownership as you can possibly do because then they're willing to follow it, you know, when they are the ones that help create it. So, yep. Related to that, we had a lot of success. Uh, our son's 14, the Society for the Blind, mm -hmm. uh, they will come and provide services to district and when, the, when he was younger they were very good at advocating on his behalf and sort of transitioning him to advocate for himself um, so I don't know if others have taken advantage of that but in our case it was the first time the district had ever worked with the Society for the Blind in yep. New Jersey but now they have a very good relationship through the special education office um, so that's been really successful and they are incredibly supportive um, with material and with technology and with anything we would ask for yeah, there's a lot of different organizations, and it varies state to state, city to city, and then school district to school district, what's offered and what you can go for outside. Um, at the end of my presentation um, is my contact information, and so if your school district isn't providing you the resources, then let me know, and I can I can look up what your state offers, and I'm happy to do that for you, because I read ed code, and so I, I you know, it took me a long time to get to that point, so <laughs> I'm happy to share. Um, okay, so back to the sheet. Uh, so you wanna make sure you talk about fluctuation in vision. You wanna talk about their null point. Um, I also, if your kids wear glasses, one of the things to know is when they have nystagmus, um, sometimes the glasses, because of where the null point is and because of their eye fatigue, sometimes the glasses actually aren't helpful and so they take them off. And then the teachers think, well, you know, the teachers can actually harass them for taking off their glasses. And so they need to understand that sometimes they need to take off their glasses to get better sight. And that's a really bizarre concept for most people. So, um, so you do wanna point that out. And then I also include a little section, so my next section is challenges from the year before. So real life examples of what happened that they, I want them to be aware of. And again, I don't think there's a single teacher that I've experienced that was malicious, that didn't want to. It's more they just don't know what to do and they don't think about it, you know, because they have so many other students. Um, and then I put in a thing, uh, I start this in sixth grade. Remember, he is still a teenager, so he doesn't want to be different. And, you know, he doesn't actually know what he sees and what he doesn't see, you know, so that's a difficulty too. Um, so put something like that. And then, I make sure they realize that for colleges, I, I'll give it, all you parents, colleges are so much easier than high schools to manage because they follow the law to the leather of the law. And so once you get there, it's all done for you. And so, so I want them to know that whatever accommodations they have in high school will automatically be transferred to college and you don't have to do anything. It's all, like they paid note takers in classes. I'm like, oh my gosh, it was, <laughs> it was heaven when they got to, to college. Um, and then I give them a list of the accommodations that we've figured out. And then usually I have some discussion questions uh, for us to start talking about. Yep. Um, isn't it true that the transition to college is more difficult if they're on an IP versus a 504? If 504 follows 504 automatically transfers. IEP is for public education K-12. And so that's a, a good, good point, is that a lot of colleges do transfer the IEPs, but not all. And, and that is a difference between public and private colleges, too. Um, so IEPs do not have to be followed by private institutions. Uh, but many do. Many do, but they don't have to be. And so, because IEPs are only for, private, uh, only for public.
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so Nothing third compared to as you get older and you know, like I said, my whole thing has always been like I go off of her feedback and like yeah. oh is she doing okay? I don't want to look for other things, you know, that she doesn't need, but I also don't want her to go away to college and her come to the aunt office and be like, you know, Susie was telling me how when she's at college she gets extra time right. and all this stuff. I didn't have any of that, you know, and then I'm yeah. like, Oh, sorry, you know, I just wanna Yeah. I, I totally, so for Juan, we started the 504 in kindergarten. You know, we were, for Nico, we're like, by that point, we don't care. You know, it's like, he's my fourth, <laughs> he's my fourth child. You know, let him navigate the system himself. And he actually, I think, did a better job of getting the accommodations by advocating for himself in doing that. What you need to keep in mind is for state, um, you know, actually, let's continue on, and we'll get to that when we get to state and local um, state and teaching. Okay, so one, another thing to keep in mind is who attends your meetings. So IEPs are very structured of who comes to the meetings, and it varies um, state to state, district to district. But here are some of the people. The vision specialist, if you don't have one, that can be replaced by the nurse in your school district. But And then the district representative, they can say the administrator. And the administrator is the principal or assistant principal, someone like that at that level. Um, usually, like I said, when I did the 504, I just met with the counselor and the 504 administrator. And we, the three of us would do the 504 plan. And if they're older, sixth grade to 12th grade, offer it to your child to also come to and have them be a part of that meeting. And sometimes they want to and sometimes they don't. But but if you're in an IEP meeting, then you will have a lot more people that will be at those meetings. Um, so another thing to remember is you are an expert on your particular child's needs, and they are an expert on education, and so on how to educate them. So build a collaborative relationship. So what I loved was having a teacher. So I always finished my presentation with my contact information. And I loved it when a teacher had something coming up and they would email me and go, I'm not quite sure what to do about this. And, you know, and then I would go, I don't know either. So I would talk to the particular child and we try to figure out what would work for them. And it just showed me that they, the teacher cared and thought about it. Um, I'll give you an example. So the PE teacher in seventh grade calls me up and he goes, you know, I'm doing a session on baseball. And I know it's going to be really hard for Juan, but Juan loves sports. And so he goes, I'd rather not give him an alternative activity at the time. So he goes, I'm thinking that maybe Sam, Sam is like a star athlete that Juan, you know, was a good friend with. So he goes, I'm thinking of putting Sam and him sharing a position in the outfield. What do you think about that? And he goes, and then I'm thinking, I like the idea so much that I'm going to put all the outfielders are going to double up and we're going to do it on communication and how you have to communicate in the outfield. <laughs> and I was like, it sounds cool to me. You know, I was like, and then Juan got to be in the activity and he wasn't singled out because there were other kids that were doubled up as well in the outfield. So um, I thought that was a great accommodation for something that should have been difficult for Juan to participate in. I will say that Nico was a, a all-star baseball player. So you know with Juan we didn't even let him try baseball and like I said with Nico we're like go have balls hit at you we don't care. <laughs> <laughs> and so so anyways um, so build that relationship and you know it doesn't come with a manual for how to handle your child's nystagmus and so you, if you can work together to try to figure it out that's the best we can do and so now we're going to get to potential accommodations Again, remember, every single child is differently. So it varies from child to child. OK, large print. When I used to go to the AND website, it had this, uh, these are typical accommodations. So from a very early age, we asked for large print for Juan. You know, it had to be above, uh, I think, 16 font. And you know, we'd made a really big deal about um, font size. We went to the low vision specialist. The low vision specialist told us it was actually bad for him to have large font because he saw perfectly well close up and that it was causing eye fatigue by having too much information. 
And so I was going, oh, you know, <laughs> who knew? We thought we were doing the right thing because that's what I heard like, people with nystagmus needed. But if your child can see perfectly well without like doing this, then they may not need large print and it may actually be doing them a disservice. And having that large test, you know, and the looking through all the material is very, very complicated for them and hard if they don't need it. My daughter's low vision specialist, and I should add, she qualified for an IEP in private school. Mm -hmm. She has an orientation and mobility specialist and yep. a low vision specialist. And a very simple accommodation that made a huge difference in her world was having all material on yellow paper. Yes, the glare, the, the glare. glare. And, and that's the thing, too, figure out if the glare is a problem. Uh, so it's interesting because Juan, no problem with, um, with light sensitivity. Nico gets migraines from the glare in the room, and his acuity is much, much better. So he can see better than Juan, but the light is, freaks him out more. So, so if the light is an issue, then usually colored paper. And that's an accommodation that they make for other kids with other uh, non-vision. Um, so some kids with different types of dyslexia will ask for it on different colored paper. And so, so they do have to do that quite often. Um, okay, so large print is one. Uh, copies of overhead or board presentations. Um, one of the things now, technology is so prevalent, and so they may just give a laptop, an iPad, or something for your child to have the presentations that they're presenting up close. And that's a great accommodation because they can blow it up and, as they need to see it. Um, sit in front of the room and the best side for their null point. And so, and again, have them sit in there, write something on the board, and figure out what the best seat in the class is. And that, I think, is a reasonable accommodation for everyone here to request in every school district. When you, I'm sorry, when you mentioned the iPad, um, we also discovered something called the Join, the Join Me app that allowed what was being yep. put on the screen yep. appeared on the iPad. Yep, and that's, <laughs> most school districts have those types of technologies now that it can automatically project whatever it's, uh, now you have smart boards and Promethean boards that automatically shoot to the, the device that your child has in front of them. So it's a lot easier to do than it used to be. Own copy of materials, sharing copies, I think it's standard for every single child with nystagmus. Um, so extra time on tests and assignments. You know, again, eye fatigue. You know, if they've come home from a long day at school, um, you know, give them some extra time. Uh, this is where you get into modifications versus uh, accommodations. It may be easier for you to say, oh, only, you know, 10 math problems, is, you know, or, or five math problems instead of 10, or 10 math problems instead of 20. Instead, ask for them to be able to do it over a weekend so they have more time to do it, but they're being asked to learn the same material. Because that's what our kids are totally capable of doing the exact same thing. And again, if they have other issues besides nystagmus that prevent them from um, doing it, then I, that's a different, I'm just talking about if they only have nystagmus and that's what they're, you know, go, what they're being accommodated for. So work for the accommodations versus the modification and giving them extra time to do the assignment so that it can be over a weekend where they can take more time to do it is always a good thing, so. Um, technology. There is so many <coughs> things in this, in this area. Some of the school districts have standard technologies that they automatically will give you. Um, magnifiers, laptops, iPads. One of the um, things I could never get my kids to use but I thought was the coolest thing is there's actually a, a pulse pen or an echo pen. And what it does is it records as the T teacher or the professor's talking. And so you write in a special notebook, and it, the notebook looks like every other spiral bound notebook, so it doesn't stand out as something different. Um, and as you're writing, it, it's recording what is being said in the classroom. So when you go back, you can hit that part of your notes, and it will play back that specific, what was being said at the time you were writing. So you don't have to listen to the whole lecture. Um, they sell them on Amazon. I think they're the coolest things ever, but of course I couldn't convince my kids that they were the coolest thing ever, so. Um, and sometimes, you, oh, what did you? What's it called again? 
It's the Echo one. I think they sell them on Amazon as Echo, but Pulse Pen was the first one that came out, Pulse Pen. And it, again, that way you don't have to go back and listen to the whole lecture. You can just listen to that. I was like, when I was in college, I would have, that would have been so cool. So, um, but anyways, and sometimes in some school districts, um, you have to go through the teachers union to be allowed to record. And so that's why having it as a 504 accommodation um, may allow your child to record a class that maybe your school district has a policy that you don't allow recording in the classroom. So, oh. how um, our child just got diagnosed, not diagnosed, just got considered gifted. So yep. here you have a child. He he's grade level for reading, but math is way beyond. How do you get? A we don't have a five or four IEP or anything. But how do you get a teacher? So he's smart in this area, but he needs accommodations. How do you put that, that together? Longer. Yeah, and I mean, it, so he wouldn't probably qualify for an IEP because he's yes. at the grade level. So then, would we try the 504? Yeah, so 504s, again, 504s are just working on what they need for their vision impairment. And again, it's the Disabilities Act, it's the Civil Rights Act. So um, your child has a disability and they need these things. And it's easy for the teacher for, to forget when you have a gifted child because they're doing fine. In he fact, they're doing glasses. better than many of the other students in the class. He and so yeah. they forget. Right now, so they just kind of yeah, they forget. And just know, again, it's not malicious. It's just you have to just keep working gently with them and say, what can I do to help and try to make it a positive relationship. Because yep. the giftedness had nothing to do with the vision, um, and the vision prohibits the giftedness from coming out. You can't see it because they're not getting, they're not taking the information to learn. Yeah. So I've basically boiled it down to a simple sentence of, just because they're smart doesn't mean they can see it. Okay. Right. <laughs> and that's what they've got to serve. They've got to serve both parts of that. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I just I keep repeating that. They will understand. And it's interesting because one of the other groups, parent groups I ran was for gifted parents and the, the issues that p gifted parents have. Because my kids, both of them that have nystagmus, were gifted as See, well. Is there any correlation at all? I, I, I read a couple studies that said yes. That, we just found out the gifted. Yeah. And, yeah. and then um, another area of, of um, we, one of the teachers uh, said that Juan probably was ADHD. And so we went through that whole assessment. <laughs> And then our pediatrician, who was very versed on nystagmus, gave me studies, research studies, that said that kids that are visually impaired can't pick up uh, environmental clues, just like kids that have ADHD. And so that's why he, he showed me, he goes, yeah, the teachers that are accommodating him were like, what the heck, this child, he's totally gifted, he has no ADHD. And then the teachers that weren't verbalizing as they were writing, we're getting the kid that had ADA, you know, like bouncing his pen and yeah. things like that because he couldn't participate fully in the class. And so, yep, in the back, and, and then I'll get to you. Yes. Yep. So say that again. Learning disability, a lot of that. Say that again. Uh, what kind of group? Twice exceptional. Okay, I just heard that term recently. Yeah, yeah. and there's a book. There's a couple books that were written that are very, very good about that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, something in my classroom that I use, I think it's pretty cool. It's called Vizio Books. Like Vizio Books, yes. Yep. Yes. So you can change um, the backgrounds. You can make it bigger and smaller. So it's a fabulous uh, tool to use. And some school districts have them. You just need to ask for them. And then um, uh, the last page. Copy of notes from teachers is extremely helpful uh, or from another student because in college they'll have note takers. We don't have note takers in high school or in grade school or middle school. Um, and then Scantron, those bubble tests. Many kids, and some kids love them. Some kids have no problem with them. But it really um, causes eye fatigue to have to look in one place and then look over on the answer sheet. So um, that's something you may ask to not have. 
And then sunglasses and hats in classrooms, um, again, for the glare. And then the ability to move seats as needed. So you might do a lot of work to pick out the right seat, and then the light conditions may change, and they may find that that seat isn't the best seat for them anymore, and that they need to move seats. Um, I'll give a story about Nico. So Nico in biology, he found that he just needed to stand up and get closer than the first seat. And so he asked his teacher, you know, is it okay if I stand over here when you're lecturing? And she said, fine. And then the teacher found that there were other kids in the class that started to get up and move. And um, at the end of the year, she said she had no idea how many kids in her class needed glasses that didn't have glasses. And she said out of the five classes she taught, that class did the best because they got up and moved to where they could see. And so then she ended up going into a, a, a teaching for a, an altern alternative at school because it was so impactful for her. But it was because Nico felt comfortable getting up and moving to where he could participate fully, which then gave the other kids in the class the opportunity to do that too. So, so if you can get your kids to do that, move to wherever they need to go. Yep, that's a 504, and that is an accommodation. Yep, that's a 504 accommodation. And so I think the next one is, oh, a few more things. Extra time on test, extra time on assignments is a 504. Um, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Let's do state and testing first. I missed this. Okay, so state and national testing. So whatever you have on your 504, which is what, by the time they start taking state and national testing, if your school requires it, which many private schools do not, but when they get to taking the SAT, the ACT, <coughs> you want to have a 504 in place at your school so that the state test and national test recognize it. So you're talking about as high school? Sometimes they start in middle school. But you, and so, you're talking about like the Iowa test? Like yes. Test? Yes. So <coughs> if they've started taking those, so those, na those, those standardized tests, they will follow whatever you have written in your 504. Okay. And so, and as, well. as private schools as well. Yep, yeah. so if your school. Yeah, 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 so that's where a lot of them, so once you start. Yes, yes. So if you want them to be accommodated appropriately on those it, tests, yes, no, yep. Well, Yep. The teacher transfers it to the bubbles so that because of the crowding, so he doesn't get it on the wrong line, and yep. his test scores are clear and show up more accurately. Yes. But yes. It's not writing, it's just a verbal accommodation. Right. But right. It's in writing. Yes. Okay. So that's what, before these state tests start, uh, because the, again, the, um, the SAT, the ACTs are very strict. Now, the good thing is, as of January of this year, you don't have to do any extra. It used to be you had to do extre this extreme paperwork to get accommodations. And now they say if your high school has done all the paperwork, then we recognize it. And so they're go looking at your high school, your middle school. Yeah? Yeah. It would have, I guess, saved me money in the long run, but um, this is something that you guys might want to look into. I don't know if you, is the McKinney yeah. scholarship like throughout the country, or is that state-specific? No, state -specific? but those are state-specific, and each state, so many states have that, where if they start in public school and the public school assess them as with a visual, visual function test and says, yep, 
some states have money in reserve to send them to private schools and so um, but many do not it varies so much state to state so but it, that's where go see those vision specialists in your school district because they can help you navigate that if your goal is to go to private school um, then work with them and see if there's a way you can do that um, yep yeah. I would go to the vision specialists at your school district because they know what your state has. You they go to conferences. You can also Google Florida McKay scholarship and just see what it says about that and then you'll at least know what it's all about. I don't really know what it's about because it wasn't yeah. a thing for me, but then you can maybe do research and just say, hey, do you guys have anything similar to this program you know, right. in your particular state? Um, so one thing is you will need a current vision exam and they don't care if you go to an optometrist, an ophthalmologist, or where you go for the current vision exam but you do need that functional vision test as well that your school district does for the, five, for the state testing, so state and national testing. Um, and then I say the low vision specialist is the best report. Um, one of the things we learned when we went to the low vision specialist was that, you know, as we're, he's testing, he goes, oh, watch this. He goes, kids with nystagmus um, or people with nystagmus because he did adults too, he said have faster reflexes. And we're like, what? And so my, we had our, our sighted kids there, our normal sighted kids as well. So he had them do the same test. And sure enough, the, kid, the ones with nystagmus react faster. And so he said in our state, which is California, that is the reason they were able to get the um, driving to be 2070 because people with nystagmus react, have faster reflexes. And so they don't need to see it as, you know, so a person steps out into the crosswalk, actually the person with nystagmus may be able to avoid it more than the person without because of the faster reflexes. So, so anyways, it was just kind of, they, they know these things and they do these tests all the time. Are low vision specialists private outside of the school? Private yeah, so low vision specialists private. are, do they're doctors. Are. Yeah, so you can Google low vision specialists. Every major um, city has them, might have more than like, San Francisco, we have multiple ones. So yeah. you don't actually have to have low vision <coughs> acuity. Oh, no. My you son, know you know, Nico okay. now, he started out at 2100, and now he's like 2025. And his favorite doctor is low vision specialist, you know. So, so yes, because you have a vision condition, they're the ones that can best tell what accommodations you need because that's their specialty. Um, and then, oops, back one, one more slide. Um, Extra time. So one of the things to consider uh, I want to share is Juan got double time on SATs and ACTs. Double time. Um, because we thought splitting it up over two days would be good for eye fatigue. But that resulted in him missing a day of school. And I think at one point you had four or five AP classes. And so, you know, that was really difficult to miss a day of school. And you, you take a lot of tests, standardized tests, when you're in, in high school. So. Nico did the time and a half and liked that better because they give more breaks. So you can ask for more breaks as a part of that testing, as a part of the accommodations you asked for. So and this is all coming from the 504 again? Yep. Okay. Again, 504. So they should be getting whatever you ask for for the SAT, they should be getting when they take normal tests. So if you're asking for double time, they should be getting that when they take it in high school. Now, in reality, my kids never needed double time on their high school test. In fact, they were probably finished for the rest of the kids because they were gifted. But you should ask for it and have it available to them in case they need it. And then my last slide is my contact information. So feel free to email me, call me with your questions because that's my job now is helping parents navigate this crazy education system. What's your experience beyond accommodations and modifications in terms of like specialized instruction. Um, like the example we've been trying to get across to folks is like as our daughter gets into middle school, note taking or scanning. Mm -hmm. you know, if you're supposed to read a passage and then answer questions for it for someone with nystagmus, that ability to scan back through yep. eight paragraphs and find a couple of keywords is far different. Um, kind of what's your experience with kind of trying to be taught some of those different <coughs> skills? Yeah, so there are um, certain programs that the school district will, may offer them to actually, like, 
uh, do maybe some speed reading so that they learn how to scan. Speed reading is all about scanning things quickly and picking out what's important. And so one of the things they may do for your child is do some speed reading to learn how do I scan this and look at it quickly. Um, but that's where we also need to give them extra time because it is really difficult for them to scan a paragraph multiple times. So when, and then when you're, you know, they were talking about the mental stress makes it, so SATs, ACTs, mental stress is extremely, extremely high. And so we just need to give them the extra time to be able to, um, to take more time in scanning it and looking at it. And so, and then one of the things, um, I will share as a parent, what we did was we sent Juan, again, our oldest one we didn't know anything about, we sent him to SAT camp and we asked them, because they do like four practice exams, and so we said, can you give him a test where it's bigger? Can you give him one that's double time? Can you give him one that's um, time and a half? Can you? So we had him practice on the different ways we could ask for accommodations so that then we knew what he felt comfortable with and, you know, and asked. You know, some were bubble blown up, enlarged answer sheets. Some were he didn't answer at all. He he circled. So, what what do you feel comfortable doing? And that worked out really well. So practicing what you're asking for, um, I think, really really helps. And so, any other questions? Yep. With the IDEA, is it covered kids from birth to three? Um, in North Carolina, they have a Okay, so the question, I, I'm sorry I haven't repeated many of the questions. So the question was, um, in the early intervention under three, is it going to be um, part of that or is it going to be excluded because, you know, it, how does nystagmus fit into that? Um, and the answer really is they get, they get services based on if they're, meeting mile, if they're not meeting milestones. And so if they're meeting the milestones, they will not be provided service. And so, at what point can she start with that testing before school starts? She can start, so zero to three, you can start testing. So it would just be private? No, nope, that's through your school district. So okay, your so school district offers testing for any child that is diagnosed with a vision impairment. Even though it doesn't meet that definition? It, nystagmus does. Nystagmus is one of the, the things for, for the vision impairment. They qualify for uh, assessment. They qualify for so assessment. They'll see whether or not, yeah. yes. So that's what we um, I'm yes. in Florida, and my son is diagnosed. Someone from the school board came to our house. Yeah. Yeah. Four months old. Yeah. yeah. So, so it's and actually. They called me and said, I think they were told by. One of the doctors, maybe. An ophthalmologist, or they had advised me to go to a place called Light House for the Blind, and yep. they came to our house and just worked with him on tracking because he was not meeting the milestones. He's three and a half months old, but he was my first child, so I was really eager for him to meet all those milestones. So I don't remember if it was my ophthalmologist or her, um, the therapist who let them know, but they came to the house and they told me there's a ton of kids in our school who have this. Try not to worry, I mean, she talked me off the ledge more than the educational part of it. She had knowledge that I didn't have and she just shared it with me about kids who are completely successful. Most of them have a 504. We're not making massive accommodations for these kids once they meet them most of the time. They yeah. know. Try to relax. So mm -hmm. she came to my house and was four months old. So yeah. it is 100% in Florida. It's yeah. Florida. Yeah. Yep. <coughs> well, Thomas, first I would just say uh, even if your kid doesn't qualify for the help, I would still pursue it privately if you can because we, you know, I had my son evaluated. He met all the milestones, but he still wasn't at potential and um, he, he has these fine motor delays now that, wow, I wish I had started OT when.
Yeah, so what are the rights if you have a 504 IEP if you choose not to do a public school but you're doing a private school? Um, so for IEPs, you have more rights. Uh, for 504s, um, you not th the school district does not need to do anything at the private school because all of those accommodations should be coming from the school itself. And some private schools are fabulous at doing those accommodations. And so it really varies school to school. But no, if you have a 504, it's not going to transfer. And so, I, and you know what, I'm going to back up from that. It varies state to state, district to district. Some school districts will go above and beyond to serve their students. And so even though they're not required to by state law or federal law, they do it. And so it's always worth checking it out and seeing. And so, yep. Mm -hmm. Before kindergarten starts, the program because we had done the private because he didn't qualify because he was still achieving milestones, just delayed for the normal kid. Um, but going into kindergarten, we wanted to make sure that there were things in place, and we're going to a private school. But we, under the 504 plan that we've got written, there is um, dedicated time for like OT and OT to work with him. So with that, because it is a service, have to be delivered by the public school system at the school. Yes. Usually they are, but again, diff different districts have different systems in place, and some districts provide those types of services under a 504, and not an, and you don't have to have an IEP. So that's where you kind of get into the muddy area. Can you give me the box with the um, the raffle tickets, and I'll pull those. Um, so yes, it varies quite a bit from school district to school districts, but they should be. Um, if your child is not meeting milestones, then they need to provide services wherever you go, if it's in private school or in public school. So then do, do you know how, like, how do you coordinate that with the school to get, like, the service there? I mean, because when, when we had the 504 set up, we said, you know, we're going to be going to a school outside of, this, of the system. And they said, oh, well, you know, we don't provide services. But then when I call someone else, they're like, oh, no, you do, but you have to coordinate. And then when I go to the school, they're like, oh, no, they automatically show up. So I just don't even know how they yeah, so go to the vision specialist for the school district. And that, and some school districts, like in mine, um, that's why I'm on the SELPA, is the vision specialist is actually shared by four school districts. And so the vision specialist should become your very close friend in, in navigating this system because, again, it's a system that needs to be navigated. I'm, I'm going to stop because of time, but I'm going to stay if there's any more questions. And then also feel free to give me a call or an email.